Hello, and welcome to episode 27 of the Physique Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on a single topic, and inside looks at our team. In today's episode, we are going to be talking about improvement season or off season, however you want to label it, um, and specifically going to be going over Alex and I's dynamic as far as Alex being my coach and my husband, um, and also going through kind of what we've done within the improvement season, um, because by my standards, it's been a pretty dang good improvement season. <laughs> um, so we'll just be kind of diving into that. You guys asked a lot of great questions over on Instagram. So if you're not following us on Instagram, we'll have it in the show notes as far as Alex and I's Instagram, as well as the physique development Instagram. But we often open up question boxes for certain topics um, or ask about topics that you want covered within the podcast. So um, just keep an eye out for those if you do want to contribute or there's normally a Google Doc in the show notes as well for you to ask different questions so we can get those to you. Cool. Well, yeah. So it's Alex and I here today. Um, and we'll be going through kind of different things for me post-show. Now, a common question that we get, and even something where I was on a recent podcast and someone asked like, hey, how do you do it with Alex being your husband and your coach? Um, so just for some clarity around kind of everything that's gone on, um, is that I was working with a different coach um, leading into my prep and then throughout my prep. And I worked with him um, a few weeks into my improvement season. Um, and Alex took over everything about 20 weeks ago. Um, and within this, I loved working with Jason. Jason was phenomenal, but it was something that Alex and I felt um, that it was going to be something that we really wanted to try together. Um, it was actually, we. I was sitting in my office and Alex walked into my office and out of the blue was just like, what if I do it all? And I was like, I'm going to need a little bit more clarity on what you're speaking on, but sure. Um, and he was asking if I wanted him to take over the nutrition side because he's always done my training. So since 20... 17, 20, yeah, 2017, Alex has done my training. Yeah. And I, I think that, um, if we backtrack a little bit here and kind of talk about why we didn't initially have me do absolutely everything, I think that, uh, from a relationship perspective, we had a lot of growing for us personally to do, uh, without that being a, a, a dynamic that was involved as this is a, uh, something that you have to be able to very much so compartmentalize and put into different sectors outside of your uh, personal relationship that is, is going to be very important for the success of both. Because if you try to intertwine the two and, and you have too much emotional, um, I guess, thought or, or actions, I guess, yeah. Um, like playing a role in how I was to coach, that's going to hinder her performance or how she looks and those different factors because I'm taking too many things that are on the personal side of things into account. And I think that, um, you know, coaches can run into that in terms of coaching their, their, their spouse um, or very close friends. Uh, and, and so we've taken our time in terms of getting to this position and, and growing our relationship and, and strengthening that. Now, understanding that we're in a position to be able to do this, but I know that at the beginning, it would have been a much greater detriment to both of yes. us. Um, one from a like a, our personal relationship perspective, but for her physique as well, I don't think that it would have been a good move on our end uh, for me to um, be making adjustments to her nutrition, especially through dieting phases and those different factors. Uh, I don't think that we were, I don't know if mature enough is, but I think that that's a part of it. Yeah. And I, I'll make it very clear that it never was a doubt of Alex's skill set. I would have had him do it all of it from the very beginning, if we thought it was going to be a good idea for our relationship. Um, and that's what people ask is they're like, how do you do that with having a relationship? Because I wouldn't want my spouse to do that, or I wouldn't want my significant other to do that. Um, and we really took our time, like Alex said, to make sure that we were in the best spot. Um, because in past preps, like he's done my training for past preps and all of that. Um, we saw once we kind of stepped back from those moments, like, hey, there was a lot of emotion going into this. There was a lot of growth in our personal relationship and a lot of growth within our business. And we needed to make sure that the focus was there. Um, so I am very proud of us <laughs> for being so mature, even when we were not mature, to realize that we weren't in the position to have him take over. And the, the thing was, is that when we got married, 
Um, and when we were getting rolling with different stuff, I basically didn't want my husband to tell me I needed to lose weight or to tell me exactly what to eat. I wanted to have that separation of he is my husband and that's what we're focused on. And it's a little bit, quote, easier with training because it's not that I feel specifically targeted um, if he's like, hey, we need to cut back on food here. Um, and that was something I mentally had to work through. And now we have a great dynamic within it. Um, and I know nothing is personal. I know more about the sport. Alex has learned more about the sport, more about coaching. Um, and we've just grown in so many aspects that has allowed us to do that. Yeah. And I think that for individuals who um, maybe their spouse is a competitor or they're also a coach or what have you, you can resonate with the fact of it would be it's very stressful on both parties um, if if the the trust and, and those different factors are not 1000 percent there. Um, and I think that we would have been jumping in too soon if we would have done it any sooner than what we did, um, because right now it's I mean, we're in a, a beautiful place. And we're going to dig into why the success has transpired through the improvement season and um, those different factors. But uh, yeah, I'm just very grateful in general for the this compartment of our relationship as a whole. I think 100%. that it's, um, it's a component of our lives. Obviously, that's a huge piece of it where um, our work and, and a passion of ours is, is connected into one thing. But to be able to do it together is a very special thing and something that I, I wanted from the very beginning, but knew that we were not ready to do. And, and now that we're in a place to take this on together is, is something that um, I don't take for granted or, or take lightly. And it just takes, I mean, and, and now we're still building. Like I, I still see uh, things that we can improve upon within the relationship and she can, can become a, a better athlete. I can become a better coach, all these different factors. And um, we'll do that together. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's going to be, it has been very cool. I was literally saying yesterday how nice it's been that he's been doing it all, especially with how crazy our schedules are, because I know as coaches ourselves, when clients have like 17 billion things going on like we do, um, sometimes it can be difficult to make sure you're hitting everything. Even if you do hit everything, it's nice that he's looped into that um, and just excited to be able to do it together. Um, and the other thing I want to touch on before we get into the questions um, is, well, this kind of goes into it, and we'll probably touch on this as we go, is that things have been better since the training and nutrition have been linked together. So when I was working with another coach for nutrition, it was still great. We still were making progress forward, but Alex didn't have the flexibility possibly or the... Yeah, I'm, I'm with within me working with other coaches when I'm doing training only, I'm in a reactive state. Whereas yeah. I am in the driver's seat when I'm doing everything, obviously, because when I'm doing the training, there are going to be nutritional adjustments, cardio adjustments that are necessary to go along with that stimulus because of the uh, taxation that that stimulus has on the body, whether that be more or less. And we've got to adjust food in, in a fashion that's more or less. And as well as cardio to being dependent of like hit or list or miss or, or however we go about that. So it's all going to, to work in unison with one another. And so more so when I'm working with a client who has a different coach for nutrition, I, I don't mind that provided that I uh, have a good relationship with the coach who's doing the nutrition. Um, but in that I'm left in a, a reactive state of kind of like, okay, this is where the food is going to be for an extended period of time. This is where the cardio is going to be. I now have to write programming that fits that and fits where the athlete is at. Um, and sometimes when I'm doing that in a contest prep setting, it's, it's very on the fly. Um, and, and there are times where food gets extremely low and, and cardio gets extremely high. And I have to uh, right programming for that. And oftentimes when uh, nutrition coaches see how I do that, because it's like, why are we trying to just inflame the body, you know, 10x more, and I back off a of volume a bunch and, and the body's responding well, they're like, well, you need to keep pushing harder. It's like, no, that like, this is where the conflict really starts to come into place is that we have a different understanding of, of training and those different factors. So um, that's why I'm just appreciative when I have the opportunity to have, uh, you know, full control over everything. Yeah. Reactive is the perfect word. And it's been something that when he changes my training, food might change just a little bit, maybe nothing drastic, but it is crazy. The difference that we've noticed um, with me working with other coaches for years before he took um, things over and being able to see the progress that we've made since then is really cool. 
So I didn't think it was going to be that big of a difference, but it truly has been um, just because nutrition and training are so linked. So we'll go ahead and go into your guys' questions, and then we'll kind of overview some different things. Um, and this is something that we are interested in kind of having more consistent, whether it's YouTube videos or on the podcast for when I do get into prep, being able to kind of have little weekly updates, talking through our thought process and the changes. So we're excited um, if we are able to do that during a, a future prep. Um, so Let's go ahead and get started. Um, one of the first questions here um, is from Chantel, and it was, what was the toughest hurdle so far? Um, this kind of goes hand in hand with another question. Uh, someone had asked, here it is, what has been the most challenging this time compared to previous ones? So uh, the biggest and toughest hurdle so far has just been how busy we've been. Um, for me in this improvement season, I each improvement season, I've been busier and busier. And that's been the hardest thing. And I'm thankful because Alex and I's relationship, we obviously work together, not only with him being my coach, but we own a company together um, with Austin. And it's just something that it, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of layers to our relationship. Um, but the thing that I'm most grateful for is his ability to call me out when I'm not living up to what I said I was going to. Um, so there was a time during the improvement season, it might've happened multiple times, um, that I just, I was still hitting macros, still getting water, still doing my cardio, still doing my training sessions, but wasn't being as intentional and wasn't carving out the time that I needed to. I was going through the motions and that goes to show that you can go through the motions and then you can be more intentional with the motions and there's going to be a big shift there. Um, so the toughest thing is just how much travel we've had, how much we've had going on. And my brain sometimes feels like it's going to explode and it's hard to be like, I'm still going to hit my numbers. I'm still going to get my water, still going to get my sleep, still going to get my training and cardio in. Um, and it was a few months back and I walked out to train and Alex was already training. And he basically just said, you can't do this anymore. And I was like, what? what do you mean? <laughs> what are you talking about? Because I was inside, like, I don't know what I was doing inside. Um, and he was like, you said you want this and you're not prioritizing it. And I was just a light bulb clicked and I reset my intentions. And it's been a lot better since then. There's still obviously room for improvement within anything that you do. But I would say that that's definitely the hardest thing is just so much more going on. Um, and the busier you get, the harder it gets um, as a whole. And it's something that that I've had to st step back and realize that um, it's if I can't necessarily have it all, all of the time, um, but I have to be able to be intentional with what my priorities are and being able to go over what those are um, instead of trying to have everything that I'm doing um, be a top priority. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just add on to that is that Sue's initial nature is always going to be put herself to put herself last and, and to uh, put others in front of her. And so in that, the the growth of physique development has been uh, substantial throughout this year and, and you know through the end of last year. And so she takes on a lot of the tasks that go on within uh, the, the managerial or, or CEO type task within physique development. So in terms of getting new coaches and, and educating and, and those, uh, just getting them rolling and getting everything organized um, amongst all of the people and, and the, the staff that's already involved, plus all the new people, like she handles all that. And so in that, she was in a, a groove of just like continuing to to put those things first. And, and I think that in the, uh, like her speaking to the facet of just going through the motions and, and still hitting her numbers, still getting her training, still getting her cardio done, there's there's levels to that. Um, and, and people will, will find this um, interesting is that individuals who are in prep, I, I, the, the athletes that we work with throughout the year, um, I can tell when they're just going through the motions. And then all of a sudden, we don't have a shift in food. We don't have a shift in cardio. We don't have a shift in training. Nothing changes. All of a sudden, things are moving. And it's like, oh, a light bulb went <laughs> off. Something happened here. Um, whether it be something I said in the check-in or they're realizing like, hey, I've been half-assing this for weeks now and I've got to turn on the jets and, and really go. Um, so I think that there's just a, a difference in intent, a difference in, in prioritization that, that Sue's taken. And there's been a lot of, uh, it's been a, a growth year for us in, in general, where uh, a lot of life stuff has transpired. I'm, I'm sure that we'll share that here in the next couple <laughs> of weeks or so, um, as we're getting closer and closer to some of those things transpiring. But, um, 
those things happening, us growing within our relationship, uh, the the business growing as it has, like it's been a lot. And, and so navigating through that, there's definitely been uh, peaks and valleys to it all from an effort perspective, as well as what's been prioritized and what hasn't. Um, but it's, you know, I, I think that overall she's done a, a fantastic job. It's just that uh, turning on the jets when it's needed, especially when uh, you're wanting to get on the national stage and, and become a professional at this sport, you have to prioritize every single day. And yeah. And first, thank you. So many kind things. I love it. Um, but it, it's something that when I said I reset my intentions and priorities, that's exactly what I did. I looked at what I had as a priority and I knew physique development and my clients were a huge priority. I knew that competing is a huge priority. And I know that there is another aspect of my life that has a huge priority. And so it's something that I knew that those were going to be the top three. And then past that, it was going to be something that I had to realize that if I wasn't progressing, in the way that I wanted to, I had made the conscious decision as far as what my priorities were. And if competing isn't your top priority, that's okay. But realize that when you go into shows, when you don't do as well as you thought you should do or wanted to do, about where those priorities stand. And that's what I asked myself because Alex has known me for years and he, since he's known me, known me as a competitor and known that I wanted to go pro. And he's not going to let me be less and he's not going to let me walk off the stage one more time in sad tears and happy tears. He'll allow it, Um, but not going to let me walk off that stage. And especially if I hadn't put it all into my improvement season and into my prep, because he would not let me complain if that was the case. If I was like, man, this really sucked. He'd be like, well, didn't put in what you wanted out of it and possibly a nicer tone than that. But That would be the general gist. And that pushes me because I know that if it comes to that point, I'm going to be highly disappointed in myself as well. So that's the toughest part (laughs) so far. Um, Then we'll go on to some other questions. Um, How big of a surplus did you have during your improvement season? Um, So like I said, Alex kind of took over about 20 weeks ago and I'm about 48 and a half, 49 weeks post-show. So almost at a full year, which is exciting. Um, And for my food um, and the surplus that I went into. So my lowest steering prep um, was around 30 fat, 50 carb and 160 to 180 protein. We kind of pushed around that protein towards the end. Now with this, if you, I mean, you guys can do math, you'll see that those are really low calories. Um, I did have refeeds throughout prep um, and I had consistent refeeds towards the end for sure. And then in between shows, food was able to rise. So I'm just telling you where the lowest was. It didn't stay there for an extremely long time, but it was a push um, plus the cardio that I was doing. As far as the highest food has gotten now, it's probably been around 24 hundred calories. Um, and that's at around, um, 60 fat, um, around 290, um, carb, not protein, um, and around 160, um, protein. Um, and that's also had about, um, a free meal per week, um, some weeks, um, and then some flexibility within travel, but not too much flexibility within travel. So that's kind of the change in food. As far as how big of a surplus that would be, um, I I mean, I I was gaining, I would say like a, a few pounds per month. Yeah, well, let's let's dig into this because I don't think that it has to be this arbitrary number. I yeah. think that people need to get away from like this, uh, like, okay, this is exactly how much weight we're going to gain. This is exactly how much of a caloric surplus we're going to gain. Because when we look at caloric maintenance, and this is going to be an ever changing number because of the activity levels that you have in place, those different factors. And our goal is for Sue's maintenance to upregulate, right? We want to add muscle tissue, thus she's going to have the opportunity to have a a higher caloric demand just organically because of that tissue that's being created or added, I should say. Uh, And so thinking of it in that sense, rather than being like, okay, I was 400 calories above my maintenance for this long, I'm going to have put on this much tissue. It's like, yes, that could be a, a standard in which you find in a textbook of this just arbitrary, 
I don't yeah. know, like medium uh, of what this is possible, but everyone is so individualistic in this, in that working with a coach who's really taking the time to look at the data, analyze things and specify it for you is going to be much more important than being like, okay, I, I, I did that. So I'm going to have put on all this muscle tissue. And then you get through the dieting phase and it's like, damn, I, I followed the numbers perfectly and I've added no muscle tissue. So it's more of individualizing it for you and finding and looking at physique photos, looking at all the biofeedback. These things are painfully more important than these, these numbers that people are getting hung up on of like, well, I was this far above my maintenance. I had to be putting on muscle tissue. Like focus on biofeedback, focus on photos, focus on intensity within the training stimulus and seeing progression there. Those things are going to be far more important and fueling for that training, of course, than having this like, okay, I pushed my calories up to 2,800. I had to put on muscle tissue. It's like, no, you didn't. Trust like, you me, really didn't. Been there, done that, didn't put on the muscle tissue. I thought I did. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it, it's just that. It, People, and I think that this was more popular in years past where coaches were posting that their clients were eating X amount of carbs or X amount of calories and like touting this as like, you should, you should sign up with me because all of my, all of my girls are eating 3000 mm -hmm. calories in their off season. Like no one cares. And honestly, in that no one wants to, it's not that fun to no. eat that much food on a daily basis. It's cool to have like a refeed there for two days in a row. But I promise you, um, being someone who has had to go to extremes with Within my food to put on any weight. It, it's not fun. It, it's not fun from a digestive perspective. It's not fun from a grocery bill perspective, <laughs> especially being that the, the time that I'm speaking on, I was still a college student who barely had money anyway. And so pushing to, you know, four, 4,500, five, 6,000 calories on a day-to-day -day basis is not ideal. And I didn't have to, I, I didn't need to have to do that. I needed to have a better understanding of how to manipulate my training and to fuel my training in those different factors and focus on other uh, components of my recovery than thinking that driving up calories and just seeing that scale move was my only indicators of success. So those are going to be the, the main things to really pay attention to. Yeah, and this is a great point also if we're talking in reference to a, like weight above stage weight. People ask this often. I, I don't think that there's a specific question. Maybe there was as far as how much weight I gained. Um, but if you go by just, oh, competitors should only stay within 10 pounds of their stage weight or they should only do X, Y, and Z. Exactly what Alex said. Pay attention to biofeedback. Pay attention to pictures. Pay attention to the bigger picture because we actually didn't go into my improvement season having a goal weight to hit. We didn't have a goal calorie to hit. We didn't have any of that. Our goal was to improve. And the great thing about that is I kind of gave him an open-ended timeline. So that does help from a coaching perspective, of course, um, that we didn't have like by this date, we need to have this happen to be able to go into prep at this point. I basically said, I don't want to prep until I'm competitive enough to actually do what I'm setting out to do. So that was a little bit helpful. But at the same point, like we didn't say we're going to get to 140 pounds in this amount of food, because I can go ahead and compare this to previous improvement seasons. Um, with previous improvement seasons, the goal was to get food as high as possible. And I got food to 3000 plus calories. And not only was it like Alex said, painful as far as eating. I got so tired of eating food in general. I just felt like my whole day was eating food and preparing the food. It was exhausting as crap. I felt like crap because the only goal was to increase food. It wasn't to improve my physique necessarily. And so it was that the fact of wanting to brag that my food was so high and it put me in a spot that I just was lethargic and I gained way more fat than I gained muscle in that improvement season. Yes. And, and to give you guys an actual rule of thumb within the improvement season, things that you need to focus on, like I said, were the physique photos and, and those factors, but you need to reach a body fat level that hormonal function is optimized. You need to find a body fat level that your sleep is great, your training performance is improving, and you're recovering well. So you're not having extended bouts of soreness. You're not having low levels of, of energy. Your digestion is optimized. Just within those biofeedback markers, if all those things, those boxes are checked, you're having a painfully successful and much better than just focusing on the, the nutritional intake of it all. Um, than what you would like in that scenario. So focus on those things more so than getting to this certain caloric allotment. Yeah. 
Next question is, did you struggle with getting rid of the volume eating mindset post prep? And this was from Ungraceful Potato that asked the question. I, I personally haven't really ever struggled with in volume eating. I know that that might not be the most helpful answer for whoever asked this as well as anyone listening, but it's something that I personally have digestive problems. I have IBS and volume eating is very hard on my digestive tract. And it's something that I can't do a lot of the tricks as far as volume eating. There's a lot of vegetables that don't sit well in my stomach. Um, there's a lot of just vegetables I don't digest well. I can't do sparkling drinks, all these other things that might be used to like gum for volume. I can't do during prep anyway. So I don't do volume eating inside or outside of prep. Now I might make a switch as far as in an improvement season, having a bagel versus in prep, having a slice of bread because it's more volume in that regard, but not these huge, huge salads or these huge volume meals that I'm eating. So I don't struggle with it in or outside of prep. What I would recommend if you do struggle with it is think about how you feel. That's what you always want to relate it back to. If you don't feel good, if your digestion is altered, you're not functioning on all cylinders. And that is going to be a problem with being able to gain muscle uh, or lose fat because it's not just you are what you eat, you are what you digest. And if you're compromising your digestion, then that can be very difficult for you. Yeah, I would just say coming out of contest prep, set yourself a meal plan and be very, uh, you know, stick to that because it's a, it's a time where things are more difficult than prep itself. And in putting yourself in a position where you have very, uh, concrete meals is going to be the absolute best option for you where, uh, individuals feel that they can let off the gas, which is a part of it. But especially that first four to eight weeks following the show, you need to be just as accurate as you once were um, within your, your dietary protocols and following what the coach is saying and, and those different factors. Yeah. And next question is, did you implement any mini cuts during this time? And that was asked by Megan. And we have not so far. Well, I think that part of this is that um, within mini cuts, I, the like within the training aspect of things where we talk about, have we even said this out loud yet, where I'm manipulating nutrition up and down with training volume? We've kind of hinted at it if we didn't say specifically. So within, within the uh, improvement seasons, especially extended ones such as Sue's, where um, mini cuts could be valuable, where if, if we had pushed body fat too high at any point, we haven't reached a, a point where I would say that we've gotten too high with body fat. Um, but there are going to be phases in which within her training that I'm going to let her digestive system relax a little bit to where we'll bring down volume and put her kind of in a deload of training, which is going to be about two weeks, generally, maybe three weeks if she's having a tough time recovering. And in that period, I'm going to bring down food too. So we're going to aim for roughly at maintenance or maybe slightly below her maintenance level um, at that point to let her just digestive system relax a little bit because we are pushing food, as she said, uh, on the higher end and training volume on the higher end. Um, so that's kind of, if you want to consider that, you know, a mini cut, you certainly could, I suppose, but uh, not with the intent of losing body fat more. So mm -hmm. our goal is to let her recover, drop some inflammation, get her appetite very upregulated. Um, if, if we saw any hindrance with us pushing food up, um, blood glucose levels, if we were tracking that, we're not at this very moment. Um, those things are what we're trying to focus on. Yeah. So we, we've done them or I've done them in the past in improvement seasons, but it's not needed right now. And mentally, I'll be on and I've been honest with Alex, I'm not in a place to diet mentally. Uh, and so it's something that we've just mitigated or he more so has mitigated that through food and training and making sure we're in the best spot. So another question as far as goal rate of gains for a week per month, but like we said, we didn't have a goal going in. And then also asked was, was training focused on hypertrophy or strength or both? And that was by heavyweights and cupcakes. Uh, so within that, I think that we utilized all of this, the, the three main pillars. So if you hear us talk about from a training perspective, we're going to have strength based or neurological based phases. We're going to have hypertrophy based phases, which is going to have a 
the largest umbrella of, of type of stimuli that we will utilize. And then we have metabolic or like metabolic conditioning. So um, we have all three of those in utilization. I, I think that the the greater bolus of the stimuli, and this is what you would want to do in any improvement season, is that the, the more time that you can spend in uh, strength-based or um, hypertrophy-based phases throughout the improvement season, the better off you are. Uh, so we'll utilize more so those metabolic phases as more of a, um, a time for her to recover and, and utilize that in a short short burst whereas in the like contest prep phases we'll be focusing very heavily on strength um, and and metabolic phases kind of going back and forth between those or utilizing both uh, accordingly uh, but it, both a hundred percent throughout the you know was a year almost. Mm -hmm. um, so over the years time utilization of both has been uh, the greatest priority. Yeah big time. And they've been hard phases, but that's where the growth happens. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question is how high are you pushing calories in improvement season? That's from Paige. And like we said, we don't have a specific number. And it's honestly been really nice because it hasn't caused any food focus. I personally don't struggle with food focus a lot of the time, like really at all. But it's been nice to not constantly be chasing a number or looking for a number or bragging about a number. If you follow me on Instagram, you know I often don't disclose my macros. I don't disclose specifics because I don't think it's helpful if I can't explain what they mean or why it's specific to me. And the reason that this podcast is a little bit different is there's more context. We're going through more. We're being very clear of not just to apply the exact same thing to each person, but it, it's been nice to not be chasing after a number, honestly. Next question here is, do you feel stronger and how has your mindset, mindset shifted? And that's from Christina. I definitely feel stronger. And if you are not tracking your training sessions, you should definitely do that in an improvement season, maintenance, dieting, whatever it may be. So it's been really cool to hit some higher numbers. Even just yesterday or the day before, I forget which day it was, We I was doing uh, incline press and I mean, at the beginning and during prep, 95 pounds was difficult. It was a working set that I needed a spot for, and it literally looked like a warm up. So I feel stronger. I am stronger. I'm performing better. And it's been really fun to be able to do that. Yeah. And I think that in the improvement season, if you don't shift your, your mindset and your focus to uh, how you're performing in the gym, you're going to be very unhappy throughout the uh, improvement season because how you look is going to change very slowly. Um, and if you're focusing constantly on like, are my delts growing? Are my glutes growing? Are my hamstrings growing? That's not going to be something that you see on a day-to-day -day basis. And more often than not, you're going to catch crappy angles of your physique. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to get more upset about that where it's like, this does, This is a, a blimp in time. No one saw you in that mirror in your hallway um, where your shirt was kind of like in a, in a bad spot and you just caught it out of the corner of your eye. Like that's, that's not the reality of things. And I think that if you don't shift, like I said, it's just going to be a... a just a negative headspace for you to take on the improvement season and you're going to cut it short probably mm -hmm. and get into mini cuts too soon and, and uh, be asking your coach to get into prep too soon. Like the, it's just, it's not worth it. Yeah. And we will also link in the show notes, the, YouTube video on reverse dieting where I talk about when you go into a reverse, you have to shift that mindset because in a diet, you can see insane changes in 12 weeks and you can see daily changes to a certain degree. In a muscle building phase, you're not always seeing that and it feels a lot slower and it feels a lot harder in that degree. And so it's something that not comparing pictures week to week and then shifting your focus to the gym and other things instead of just your body weight or exactly how progress pictures look. There's been times throughout this where I have not liked my progress pictures. I send them to Alex. I move on with my day. I don't sit and overanalyze it. I look back in a few weeks and I realize where the shifts were and I move forward with that instead of sitting and dwelling and picking apart things week by week because that's not needed. Uh, so how long should an off season be? We've kind of already touched on this, but an off season is gonna be as long as you need it to be. That's 
something that a lot of people don't take into consideration. If the judge has told you you need to grow and you have a considerable amount of muscle that needs to be built, it's going to be a longer off season. If it's something where it's a conditioning aspect and maybe you just need some time away from dieting, that can be solved within a year. If it's something where you don't need that much muscle change, maybe that can be solved within a year. Some people it's going to take longer where competing season to season doesn't always get you the benefits that you're going to want or need to be able to be successful. So it's as long as you need it to be. Yeah, I think it's just as long as it takes for you to make the improvements that are necessary. I think that uh, if you can, and and unfortunately, more people have to go through this to take this to heart. Um, and in, instead of just hearing someone say it and, and listening to the, the words, but if you are going from, you have a, a beautiful season, it goes very well, and you want to get right back into prep the next season, but you needed to put on some serious tissue for you to, let's say that you want to be an IFBB pro and be very competitive on the national stage. You just had a, a good season. Maybe you got eighth on the national stage. Um, and I see competitors do this where they just immediately get right back on stage thinking that it's it's going to take them from that eighth spot to the first spot just in terms of like a three month off season or a four month off season. It's like the, the difference between eighth and first is, is pretty considerable where we look mm -hmm. at any of the national shows that we've been to this year from eighth place to first place is a, a pretty decent gap in terms of muscle density, potentially uh, posing conditioning amongst all facets. So in that understanding that if you would just take a full year off, right, you take the whole next season off. I know that that can sound daunting and be like, I'm missing out on, all the fun and, and, and seeing all of my friends and these different things, I get that. And guess what? You can still go to the show. It's cheaper if you go <laughs> as a spectator and just enjoy and go see your friends uh, who maybe didn't compete the year before and you go and enjoy those national shows. But you're going to be much more happy if you take the full year off, put on the tissue that the, the judges really told you to put on you come back and you're immensely competitive and now you're, you're battling it out for the top spot. Um, you're going to be much happier rather than just continuously coming back and getting that sixth to 10th placing and just kind of bouncing between there for years upon years, because you're not taking the time to put on the tissue that's necessary. Um, and being, you know, you're just going to feel, uh, I don't know, uh, Sucky. I yeah, mean, it's sucky. gonna, I mean, it is hard having a longer improvement season. I'm not gonna try and negate that or just be like, no, it's easy. Take all of the time off. I get that it's hard. I get that competing is fun and the glam is fun and all that jazz. But at the end of the day, if you place, let's say, in that sixth, and on spot or even like fourth and on that the the national shows we've been at it's been extremely competitive so let's say that you've placed four or fourth to 16th at a national show to get to that first place spot if you compete the next season you might move in a few then you're going to have to compete again and you're probably still not going to get it because of a short improvement season. And then it might take you actually longer and it will drain your bank account. And that's really mentally difficult to get up on the national stage and suck shit multiple years. Like to not reach your goal multiple years on the national stage is harder, in my opinion, than just taking the extra time in the improvement season and cheaper. Um, so it's something that you want to come back undeniable. I could go back this season and still place well, or I, I couldn't have competed this last season with how COVID prep went, but uh, I could have competed back to back seasons and improved but I wouldn't be in the spot that I am now. And that's more important to me than showing up just to show up. All right. Um, when is prep starting and how long we're past off seasons? Uh, all of my off seasons have been around like 40 weeks to a year and a half. So I've taken, I haven't ever competed back to back seasons. I have been like in the fall of one season and then like going into the spring of like the next season or whatever that may be. Uh, so we don't know exactly when prep is starting. If it comes to around January and I'm in a good spot and I feel good and I want to do it, then we might. But if I wait another year, I'm not torn up about that either. So we don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's just like I said, it, it's a matter of when she is is ready. She's out of the tissue that is um, needed, and uh, we're we're on a, a good path to be there. Uh, but she's got a lot of sessions ahead of her to be where we want her to be, and um, to be the the goal is to get up on that stage and, and uh, certainly be 
the absolute best person in that class. There, there's no other goal than that. So until that goal is achieved, then we're just going to continue to work because the work is the, the fun part, you know, truthfully, in, in terms of the uh, day-to-day activities where uh, that's where Sue really thrives in terms of, of getting things uh, accomplished and, and seeing that just the penny deposits from a day-to-day perspective coming to accumulation. And, and whenever that, that we, we have the opportunity to uh, bust open that uh, penny deposit piggy bank, then we'll, we'll take that opportunity, but we're still just making our little deposits on a day-to-day basis right now. Yep. And so we'll just wrap up with these last few questions. Uh, what would you say is a number one reason people fail in their improvement seasons? Not taking the time that they need and not prioritizing what's going on would be my opinion. A lot of times people gain unnecessary fat in their improvement season because they've gone from season to season and they've been so restrictive that they end up gaining more fat than is needed and then being in a spot where they want to prep again because they really just want to get to a more comfortable body position. Uh, And so it's something that really I feel is where people fail is not taking the time that they need and not being intentional about that time. They'll be 100% when prep comes, but during the improvement season, they're 50 to 70%. 70 at best. Like 70 would honestly be much better than what, you know, you're thinking of. Yeah. Because I, I already know who, you, who you've got kind of turning in the brain right now. <laughs> um, but I would say that, that the individuals like going off the rails, following the show, and then kind of having to battle this already excess body fat place because of the poor adherence literally for the two months following the show. Um, so I, I think that if, if you can optimize those first eight weeks, I mean, you're in a really good spot to have a much more successful improvement season no matter what, and then obviously taking as long as you need to actually be an improvement season. Yeah. Um, Some of the last few questions are similar as far as how quickly or how much did you bring up Cal's post show um, from Sable? Hi, Sable. Uh, Did you or how much did you increase macros immediately post show? And then um, talking about a meal plan. So I'll kind of go into uh, the meal plan. I was never on a meal plan and I've never been on a meal plan. I do structure my own meal plan off of my macros just to make sure digestion is prioritized and I'm getting everything done. So I have not personally been on a meal plan. Uh, So I do take time off of them post-show because I was never on one. (laughs) As far as increasing calories, they were moved up relatively quick post-show. Something about me is that I have a a pretty adaptive metabolism, which means that food has to go pretty low, but it can go pretty high on the opposite end. And so it's something that we're able to move food up, um, especially because I'd been in a deficit so long, my body was really happy to see that food come through. Uh, And then um, how did you deal with not wanting to overeat post-show? I've never personally dealt with having to overeat post-show. A big piece of advice I'll give you as far as overeating post-show is not excessively planning post-show treats. I don't think I have brought any treats to a show post-show that are like these crazy, crazy treats. And sometimes I don't even have planned where we're going to dinner because that's not what's on my mind. Competing is what's on my mind. And so the biggest thing is making a plan for yourself. What's get what gets measured gets managed. And if you're not keeping track of what you need to accomplish and what that's going to look like and being very open and honest with your coach, then that's where you're really going to struggle. Yeah. I I think that just making it a part of your life at this point of wanting to prioritize your health and focusing on it in that fashion is going to remove you from this overeating component where you are now following you're, you're continuing to follow your, your dietary protocols because you want to optimize you and your health and, and prioritize uh, you being your best self and, and over consuming and eating all this junk food, if you will, or, or what have you, um, is not doing that. And so if you're coming from a place of wanting to be the best version of yourself, then you're going to certainly mitigate some of those uh, treats, if you will. Yeah. And ask yourself, why am I focusing on the food? Why am I wanting this food? Why is this having such a big pool? And then also realizing if you need to take a step back from competing with the restriction of food of it taking a toll on you mentally and realize you're a lot stronger for stepping away because you know it's going to benefit you mentally than just pushing through for the sake of pushing through. Yeah. I I was just going to say that like if you feel like if you're coming out of prep 
and it's this huge relief off of your shoulders in terms of like your overall life, then you really need to reanalyze things and say, is this, is this worth it for one? Um, and, and two, uh, what can I do differently in the future preps to not have this be this massive, just weight lifted off my shoulders when it's over? Because if that's the case, one, it's not like, to me, it's not worth it. Mm -mm. It's like it, for a, a majority of individuals, this is not bringing them home any money. It's it's sucking them of money more so. Um, and if it's taking away from your personal relationships and all these different things, and you can't make it part of, of everything and make them all coexist, you know, weigh your pros and cons, and it may just not be in the cards for you. And as much as you admire it and you love the sport, like uh, I love track, like the Olympics is going <laughs> on right now. And I love and admire the the 400 meter hurdle specifically. That is one of the most fascinating Insane. feats of athleticism that I've seen in a long time. As much as I admire it, my gosh, I will never go out there and try to jump over those hurdles <laughs> and try to uh, me running a 400 meter. I'm going to be pretty gassed at the, I mean, I may not make it, you know, <laughs> and just not even having the hurdles. And then these individuals, men and women, I mean, just flying over these is, is fantastic. But just as that, like, I'm going to admire it and love the sport, but I'm definitely not going to try it because I know it's not for me. Yeah. And just because you stop competing, if you do, doesn't mean you have to stop training. It's just figuring right. out how things fit best into your lifestyle. So to wrap things up here, I want to highlight some things that I have done in my improvement season and Alex can tack on that I think have been really helpful. One, um, and these are things Alex implemented. So shout out to him. Uh, daily walks. It's something that cardio in the improvement season, some people like to take it completely out. I'm extremely sedentary and it's something where getting out of the house or going outside and moving my body makes me feel so much better. It helps with my digestion um, and helps within just being able to feel better throughout the day, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, implemented daily vacuums. If you do not know how to perform those, then we do have a YouTube video and I have a highlight on my Instagram you can check out, but that's really helped with core control. And then... Uh, just food quality and sourcing to make sure that I'm not being an asshole just because I have flexibility have been huge things for me and really having Alex be the focus of my general health and my quality of life. I mean, Alex, I have always said it, it's never been due to his lack of ability that he wasn't my coach. It was due to us making sure our relationship was in the best spot. I actually felt very left out and jealous that he wasn't my coach because I've always looked up to him as a coach. Um, and I've seen how amazing he's been able to do with other clients. And I was always wanting that for myself. And so it's been so great to see this side of him more, even though he was already doing my training, I get to see more sides of him as a coach. And it's been extremely rewarding for me, show me where I need to improve as a coach, uh, as well as to build our relationship as business partners, as that coach client relationship and as husband and wife. And it's been extremely cool to see how detail oriented he is, how extremely smart he is with everything he does within my training and the small manipulations within food and really making sure everything lines up with what's going on. So I can't thank Alex enough for coming into my office and just asking if he can do it all. Uh, and I am so glad that he has been and it's been such a rewarding experience. And I mean, of course I love it because I've seen some of the greatest strides in my physique that I've ever seen. So shout out to Alex, uh, the changes he's made and he will continue to make and keep an eye out because when I do get up on stage, it will be undeniable. It'll be very good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I guess other things to add to the things that we've uh, made a priority is just uh, focusing on hormonal health. Uh, we have the the means to be able to get uh, blood panels for Sue on a consistent basis, and so getting that done on on a on a regular basis within maybe every three months or so um, has been something that we've utilized, uh, and that's been a, a huge benefit to us. Just wanting to uh, maximize her her uh, cycle health and just hormonal profile files in general. Um, I guess, I mean, and, and just overall, like this is the hardest that she's trained. Uh, this is the most intensity that she's taken to her training. I think that uh, one thing that many athletes that 
come to us. They come with um, maybe a lack of confidence that they are able to really push within their training and and going for it where we, we have a large emphasis on execution and, and, and doing the exercises correctly and those things. But then we there's you can push that too far where you're you're so caught up in the execution that you're sacrificing a ton of intensity. And then it can you know, swing to the other side of the pendulum as, as you guys have seen within other coaches and those different factors where it's all about intensity and very little about execution. So it's a perfect balance between the two that individuals have to get to, to see the maximal progression that they can. Uh, and I think that the biggest component of this improvement season, yes, um, me, me taking things over, things have changed uh, to a greater degree, but really it's been since the day it started is that Sue has had much greater training intensity. Her strength has improved the most. Uh, she's had the execution down for for a good bit of time we're still working on uh small bits and pieces and that's for forever like you, you're, you're never going to be perfect within each and every exercise like even even myself where i am painfully hard on myself and and very very specific within how the execution of movements work um, i still have things that i'm working on on a day-to-day -day basis and, and fine-tuning things so i think that that's a you know something that we have to vocalize too is that the training intensity and, and every single day there hasn't been a, a day that that sue has taken off there hasn't been a day that um uh, well i shouldn't say taken i'm saying training session that sue has taken off she's definitely had her off days. <laughs> Um, but she's, she's brought the same intensity time and time again to every, every, uh, you know, session. Um, uh, and I guess another aspect to, to bring up is that there has been, you know, there, there's free meals, there's, we've been on vacation in that time frame. There, there's components to this where there is, um, uh, some relaxation. Don't think that this is just like pedal to the metal, full throttle gas the entire time, because that's not true and not going to be sustainable, but it, it is 90 plus percent uh, of the time has been uh, really pushing hard and, and optimizing everything to a T. So, um, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, of course, there's a different push within prep versus improvement season. But if you know you're checking those boxes, then that's what matters. There, There's going to be a little less go in the improvement season, but still checking those boxes no matter what. So, yeah. yeah. And I, I think that um, if you're a true competitor, you can, you can recall the, the last placing that you had, you can put yourself in that scenario and, and feel yourself feel the emotions that you had. Um, and I think that athletes need to do a, need to always keep that at the forefront of their mind. If they're wanting to see those improvements of, you know, how that felt, you, you, you can still taste what that felt like. Um, if you can do that, recall that situation, whenever you're wanting to skip your cardio session, when you're wanting to veer from the protocols that you have in place, like if you're a true competitor, you're going to be able to do that and be able to really excel, uh, and you utilize that as fuel to change it next time you're in the, uh, in prep. Well, thank you guys for asking the questions. Uh, hope we answered them and got you the information that you needed. If you have further ones, like I said, there's going to be a form in the show notes as well as the other videos and topics that I touched on. But thank you guys so much for listening and we'll catch you in the next episode. See you guys.